be given by Nate Abney, and I see the title has changed slightly, but it is still about many body localizations. <laughs> okay, again, uh, thank the organizers for uh, <laughs> inviting me, but I'm not sure I should thank them for making me talk twice. <laughs> and certainly, but they should thank you for listening twice. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about sort of a, a, a problem which is both very old and very new. Uh, the experiments uh, actually that we've been working on this for a, a very long time and we've, we've, I think some of the new language that's been introduced about uh, many body localization might be helpful. Uh, so this uh, collaboration here has been uh, going over many years with Tom Rosenbaum, uh, who's now at uh, Hall Tech. Uh, various uh, students, former students of his, uh, actually mainly from, from Chicago, but have moved on, as well as my uh, old group in, in, in the UK, and uh, with a little bit of input also from uh, Sue Coppersmith, who's now just moving from uh, Wisconsin to Sydney. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, give the outline. Uh, uh, so I'll just give you a sort of a brief introduction uh, which I just copied from a review article, which you can also read, but uh, to save you the trouble uh, about uh, thermalization and the many body localization problem, why we think it's important. Uh, then I'll, I'll tell you why we think that this particular magnetic salt that we've worked on for uh, such a long time uh, is actually a, a possible solid state realization. Uh, then uh, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, or rather a lot about, the, the sort of the heart of the matter, which is, which is how uh, we can actually get uh, very different, uh, seemingly stable uh, states, depending actually on, on bath coupling. So there's, there's a, essentially a phase transition which depends on bath coupling in, in this uh, system when it's disordered. Uh, then I'll, I'll discuss a, a method which is really an old method uh, from physics on how to probe uh, localization uh, even in, in dense many body systems such as this. Uh, so let me just, just uh, essentially go and uh, copy for you uh, what you can read in, in this very nice review article by, by David Hughes and uh, Nagashore. And uh, just to remind you of what the issue is. So uh, you know, there's always this, this problem that we have when we think about uh, statistical mechanics and thermodynamics and how we make the contact between that and, and quantum mechanics. And this, essentially, uh, we bring in this uh, mystical bath, which has mystical temperature. And, and normally, uh, you know, the prescription that we have is, is we, we have some kind of a bath which defines temperature for us. And then we, we have a system inside and then we occupy its quantum levels using uh, the temperature that's given. So using some kind of a, either Bose-Einstein or Fermi-Dirac distribution with whatever is appropriate for the statistics of the particles that live within this quantum system, uh, you know, for which we, we, we pretend to know how to do calculations. Uh, so, of course, the prescription of quantum statistical mechanics is to say, well, the system uh, is somehow its, its own bath. Uh, you can take a, essentially, you can set some up some boundary conditions, you, which could be uh, what you think is high temperature, let's say randomize everything, and, and then run uh, some kind of Heisenberg equation of motion, and, and eventually, if you wait long enough, you'll get an answer which might correspond to what you measure in the lab. So this is, these are the two approaches. This is sort of the uh, normal thinking that we have, particularly as experimentalists. This is how a theorist might uh, think of it if he had infinite uh, computing power. And, uh, but this actually really uh, sets up, these two things really set up the question is what is the relationship between these two pictures? And in particular, can, can I, I think, is, is a quantum mechanical system really, uh, how does a quantum mechanical system actually act as its own bath? If I take a chunk of material uh, and I put it, so to speak, uh, on ice and I, I, I just let it sit there, uh, you know, how, how, does that, how does that work if there's no contact to the outside world? And, and the question is to what extent is contact with the outside world equivalent to just contact with a, a system, a large end system by itself? This is a fundamental question, is can a system function as its own bath? And uh, this problem, 
actually turns out has deep connection to the problem that we've been hearing about all morning, uh, which is uh, the, the localization problem. So if we can actually divide the system uh, into regions which are characterized by localized states, then the system really can't function as its own bath. And thermalization of the variety that we described initially just, just simply uh, can't occur. So if you take, let's say, just some set of spins, uh, then, of course, if they're just localized and not, not interacting, uh, each of these uh, things will just live on its own uh, block sphere. And uh, I'll just get some kind of a product state which will just never, uh, never uh, thermalize. So there's a deep connection between localized states and, and uh, thermalization. Uh, in fact, uh, now the question is, of course, uh, in life, as you know, there's always some further range interactions. And that's, of course, again, was the theme of the first talk, is uh, uh, once we introduce the, the further range interaction, uh, do we uh, defeat localization or enhance it? And, and I've just uh, reproduced this table. I'm not going to go through it here because you can do that uh, on, on your own time uh, when you're in an airplane. Uh, but basically, uh, uh, the, the question is, is if uh, obviously we, we can say a lot of things about the single particle localization, but once you introduce many body interactions, uh, then uh, how e essentially uh, can we, uh, uh, to what extent can we thermalize uh, to what extent are there actually uh, effects uh, that last uh, a long time uh, but still result in, result in dephasing. Now, why should we care about all this? This all seems very 19th century. Uh, in some ways, a sort of question of philosophy. Uh, maybe uh, people in <laughs> Vienna would have worried about this, but uh, you know, we're all modern in the Western uh, world. Uh, why should we care about this? Well. Uh, the point is that the states that we see and prepare in real systems are not necessarily given by equilibrium statistical mechanics. In fact, the, the existence, of course, of cold atom experiments uh, and the success is, is entirely uh, the fact, uh, due to the fact that they're, they're completely out of equilibrium. In fact, if, if, if for some reason, and, and, and they're simply, uh, and, and we learn a huge amount of physics because they're out of equilibrium and relatively isolated from the, from the outside world, and that's what makes that approach to science so, so efficient. Uh, but when we're dealing with real, real solids, of course, the question is, can we use essentially the approach uh, of, of cold atoms where we prepare the states uh, sort of, as it were, completely independent of each other and then move them together? Can we stabilize interesting states, including those with interesting quantum properties, in, in, in real materials. And of course, the ultimate, of course, in prepared states in real materials will be some kind of a solid state uh, quantum computer. So there's a very deep connection between uh, essentially can we uh, control uh, many body localization uh, in, in, real, uh, in real systems. As if, we, if we can, we can build a quantum computer. Of course, if we can't, we're, uh, we're just uh, uh, being funded. So uh, the uh, question, of course, uh, that's all philosophy. So can you do real experiments now? People, theorists, uh, in many ways, have been ahead of us uh, on this. And they can do real experiments uh, with, uh, on real computers. So they can do experiments with classical silicon. And, and so basically, the, the idea is somehow to, to make a model system uh, you know, where you have a quantum mechanical system, and then you have another quantum mechanical system, which is his path. And uh, basically, Robin Bott and his collaborators did some uh, very nice experiments on, on coupled uh, one-dimensional spin chains, uh, where essentially they had two uh, spin chains. I won't go into the detail of this, but essentially one ch spin chain functioned as the path for another spin chain. Uh, they proceeded to look at the, the localization properties on, uh, on uh, the, you know, these spin chains as they, as they uh, turn up uh, essentially the interaction uh, between the two of them. So this uh, interaction strength, your G, is, represents the coupling, uh, as it were, to the, the other uh, 1D, uh, 1D chain. And, and what they found is, is that actually uh, as they changed, uh, as they, as they changed uh, for instance, the bandwidth uh, 
or, or the bath coupling, actually they could, they could cross over from uh, relatively delocalized uh, uh, states here. Of course, the proxy for localization is simply looking for very sharp eigenstates of the system. And, and they could actually tune essentially the sharpness of the spectrum as a function of the coupling. So there are clearly uh, bath coupling effects that can actually see uh, transitions uh, between essentially localized and delocalized states as they change uh, the bath coupling with this particular model of the bath. So here they just explicitly modeled the bath. Sorry, what was yep. plotted here? These, these are just the, uh, uh, this, this is just the density of states as a function of energy. Okay, so these are, these are just uh, basically transverse fieldizing chains, but it doesn't really matter what, what it is, is they just essentially brought two chains into contact with each other and looked at the local, essentially looked at, at whether you had a dispersive uh, exciton. So what happens, of course, in these, in these systems is, is, as you know, you get some kind of a, I mean, these are all mapping onto what Eduardo and people like Dan Fisher and so on have been doing for a long time. But, but you can actually get essentially crossovers between the localized uh, states, which are non-dispersive, to dispersive states, exotonic-like uh, states, depending on this coupling. And as I said, this is the, the Hamiltonian, which you can recognize essentially as, as a, essentially what boils down to two uh, transverse fieldizing models coupled to each other. So you can do very nice models with that. Now, the question is, uh, uh, is, is can you do this, uh, can you implement anything at all like this in a real experiment? And, and uh, what, uh, to, to do something which is, is interesting and simple enough, you, you really want also to deal with a transverse fieldizing model. And so you want to look for a, a, a real, as it were, realization of the transverse, field, uh, transverse fieldizing model. And what I'm just uh, reviewing for you here, the basic properties uh, of, of that model, in case you've forgotten them. But basically, uh, what you start out with is, of course, an Ising Hamiltonian. Uh, that doesn't do very much because the Hamiltonian commutes, of course, with SZ, or sigma Z. I'm sorry, I changed notation there. Uh, but the moment, of course, that I turn on this transverse field, uh, then there's non-trivial dynamics, and I get uh, non-trivial uh, evolution. And in particular, of course, uh, I can tune this uh, quantum fluctuations uh, just as I can tune temperature. And in fact, there's a paramagnetic to ferromagnetic transition at t equals zero, a quantum phase transition, which is exactly analogous to the thermal transition that you find when gamma equals zero. And there's a nice phase diagram uh, terminating at one side in the classical uh, critical point at finite temperature, which is of order, of course, j and uh, at, uh, at finite transverse field again, which is of order uh, j when t equals zero. So that's all very interesting. So now I have to add some other elements uh, now uh, to make life interesting and to get localization, I need to throw in some disorder. And so uh, there, what that means is I want to disorder the, let's say the jijs. And uh, of course these interactions uh, uh, can be uh, quite simple. Uh, before they're disordered, I could have, for example, a ferromagnet uh, or an anti-ferromagnet, depending on the sign of the interaction. Uh, but, uh, and in both of those cases, I get a phase diagram of exactly the kind that I showed you. I can either have a nail state or a curious state. Uh, but what we want to do is have some complexity, so we introduce an interaction uh, of random uh, sign. So the question is now in this dense system, dense sort of spin system, uh, in a transverse field, uh, uh, can I get uh, uh, localization effects? And in fact, uh, a little exercise, which I'm sure you've all done with your students, is, is uh, yes, at least you, you certainly can if there are just three spins. Uh, so uh, if I have three spins on, a, on an anti-ferromagnetic triangle, for example, there are three Ising spins, you know, I fix two of them, they're happy with each other, but the third guy uh, doesn't know which way to point. So this is, a, in fact, a localized, uh, a very simple way to create a, uh, a, a, a basically a, a daycare center version of many body localization. And so that's a, a trivial thing. Now what happens, the question is what happens when you, when you have 
uh, you know, 10 to the 23rd atoms uh, with these kinds of configurations. And, and so uh, what we need is, is some kind of a magnet which implements this model. Uh, so uh, the system that uh, we've actually been working on for many years with Tom Rosenbaum is, is a series of, of magnetic salts uh, with a chemical formula, uh, basically lith lithium and then rare earth uh, tetrafluoride. So all you need to know, it's a body center tetragonal thing. Uh, it grows in very large uh, uh, single and very clean uh, single crystals. And the uh, basic point is that you can uh, replace, uh, it's an isostructural dilution series uh, where you can uh, essentially start out with lithium yttrium fluoride, which as you know has a filled D shell, uh, no spin on it at all. Uh, and then you can replace that, uh, uh, those, in the, in, uh, those e with uh, homium atoms, for example, uh, each of which now has an S equals 2. This is now an F equals 10, of course, partially filled shell, which has S equals 2. And so the atomic radii are, this, are essentially the same. So this is an extremely smooth, uh, very nice uh, alloy. Uh, now, uh, this is what the material look like. looks like. It's just it's nothing interesting if you want to work on, on metals. But it's lovely if you like to do optics. Uh, let me just uh, review now the crucial, some crucial features of the single ion physics, uh, which also actually in, will introduce what we're doing about a bath coupling, what we're doing about the bath. Remember, we, I said at the beginning, of course, you want to have some bath which we understand just as well as we understand the system. So single ion physics, of course, you start off, uh, you know, just re reviewing, you know, your atomic physics. You start off with some kind of a Hund's, uh, Hund's rule coupling. You have essentially a set of, uh, of angular momentum eigenstates, uh, which then, uh, because of strong uh, spin-orbit coupling, actually uh, wind up getting uh, split into various uh, uh, usual uh, angular momentum terms. Uh, these energy scales are all very large here. Just this, uh, this energy scale here at the end of the day is 7,400 Kelvin. Very, very uh, big number, almost an electron volt. Uh, essentially produces for you a ground state multiplet of J equals 8. Uh, and then, of course, you stick it in a crystal, and then there's further splittings uh, into crystal field levels. Uh, and with the outcome that at the bottom, here uh, you get actually a crystal field doublet, a uh, ground state separated from uh, excited states uh, by, by uh, energies of order, uh, of order Kelvin. So this is the lowest, these are the lowest uh, crystal field eigenstates here. And so you have a nice uh, doublet, non-Kramer's doublet here, uh, separated from excited crystal field states. Uh, remember it's a tetragonal uh, system. And now uh, those are your basic electronic degrees of freedom. Now your bath is actually provided by the hyperfine coupling to uh, a set of uh, nuclear spins. So actually each of these uh, uh, electronic spins now is coupled uh, via a hyperfine coupling of 40 millikelvin to essentially a, a nuclear spin of seven halves. Okay, so you have eight levels uh, which actually are going to be key for thermalization. Now, uh, we've done optical measurements recently just to, 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 to see all of these things. Uh, and there's a variety of ways to, to look at them. Uh, this shows essentially real data that we've uh, taken uh, showing you all of these different uh, energy scales in the problem. So you have your uh, LS coupling out at 110 terahertz, that's half a volt. Uh, and then going down crystal field level, 600 gigahertz, that's typical splittings. And then uh, at the, if you go to the bottom at this uh, few gigahertz level, there are these uh, uh, hyperfine uh, levels. Uh, yes? So it means each electronic spin effectively has its own bath. Has its uh, own little tiny bath, and yes. they are mostly or essentially decoupled, right? In that, yeah. That, yeah. So they're, yeah. They're, well, depending on how dense, of course, I'm going to get to the interactions in a minute. So there are, this is now the single line limit. Yeah. And so, so this is sort of the little bath for each spin when it's lives by itself. Uh, low energy excitations, actually low energy crystal field excitations, uh, you know, were seen ages ago using inelastic uh, neutron scattering. Notice here, uh, now these are millivolts, you don't actually see the hyperfine uh, splittings 
uh, because the resolution's not good enough. But recently we've done uh, essentially terahertz uh, spectroscopy using uh, pulse lasers. And I'm not gonna describe how this works uh, here, but just to show you how important it is to, to have such things to really see what's going on uh, using actually terahertz spectroscopy. And here's the instrument. Uh, here's the data that's taken essentially in the time domain. Uh, what you do here actually in this form of spectroscopy is and it's a prepared state. Uh, you, whack the you whack essentially the sample twice with uh, uh, very fast optical pulses. Then you do autocorrelation spectroscopy. And at the end, you just take a Fourier transform and you get actually beautiful low-lying crystal field levels. So now you're seeing really the low-lying crystal field levels, including their hyperfine splittings. Uh, and these are now the things that really matter when you're doing uh, physics, low temperature physics, uh, which is what we're interested in doing to pursue the localization problem here. So now down in this uh, frequency domain, you can see now the first and second crystal field levels, uh, you know, which will be mixed also by perturbations such as external field or strain. And here you can see them in their full glory uh, with their hyperfine splittings. Now, that's just a blow up. Uh, and uh, we've played all, there's actually all kinds of interesting physics one can do just with the single levels to see exactly how they relax uh, as a function of temperature and uh, transverse field. But I'm not, that's not the subject of this talk. So the system that we're looking at is this lithium homeofluoride. We've seen it in the very dilute limit. And we've seen essentially these, uh, this hierarchy of energy scales for the single ions at the bottom of which is this nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear term and these crystal field terms. Now, uh, the, now, what about the interactions if we have a few atoms? Well, if you have a few atoms, actually uh, what matters is the most is the dipole interaction. These are very big uh, uh, moments that we've got. It's a G equals 14 doublet. And so we have very big uh, G factor. So the dipole interaction is, very, is actually quite appreciable. It's of order of Kelvin. So it's bigger than that hyperfine coupling. And, and we have this nine Kelvin gap to the next state. And, and the outcome is that in the dense limit, dense and pure limit, you get a ferromagnetic ground state, and, uh, which you can just establish uh, using a conventional susceptibility or due to diffraction, any number of favorite techniques. This shows the diverging susceptibility at the Curie temperature, which is produced by the dipole interaction of 1.53 Kelvin. You get a very nice uh, uh, divergence, uh, precisely, uh, actually, uh, uh, almost precise uh, Curie-Weiss law because the dipole interaction, you may remember, uh, in, in, uh, for the dipole interaction, dipole ferromagnets, three dimensions, is the upper marginal dimensionality. And so now, uh, we're going to put in quantum mechanics, so we want to put in transverse field. And so what happens with the transverse field is it mixes uh, the, the ground state and the excited state to produce a splitting, which essentially uh, allows you then to write the, the system with an effective Hamiltonian, uh, which is just a very simple uh, uh, transverse field uh, Ising model, where you're dealing just with this ground state manifold. Now, uh, of course, this ground state manifold, uh, because of the hyperfine coupling, actually is a bit more complicated. But just at 36,000 feet, this basically uh, looks like that. So that's uh, uh, so one can now test the simple uh, picture I showed you about the transverse sealed Ising model uh, a few minutes ago. And there's the experimental setup. You can put a transverse field on uh, in the laboratory, literally a transverse field, and at the same time. Uh, probe the system so the transverse field in this case is this big uh, 8 to 10 tesla uh, superconducting solenoid and then inside of course we can put uh, little coils to measure the longitudinal response along the Ising direction and what we get is uh, a lovely phase diagram which looks exactly like what I showed you before uh, so here's a paramagnetic phase uh, here's a ferromagnetic phase here's my Curie point uh, and here's my uh, simple theory. Uh, interesting enough, the quantum critical point is, uh, is actually pulled up. And of course, what pulls that thing up is the fact that at low temperatures, the hyperfine interactions come in. And what I'm disordering is a composite degree of freedom.
composite electronuclear degree of freedom rather than just the electrical, uh, electronic degree of freedom. And that uh, actually pulls up the quantum critical point. And yet one can, of course, still uh, look at all the nice critical properties, look at the diverging susceptibilities. Again, uh, they agree essentially perfectly uh, with the mean field theory. Okay, so that's a, an old story. Uh, and uh, now we're going to introduce complexity via randomness. Now, I told you it was a dipole interaction, and you'll all remember, of course, the dipole interaction is tricky because in some directions, uh, you know, this way, for example, it's ferromagnetic, whereas if I hold these Ising spins uh, fixed in space and go to the equator, of course, the interactions are anti ferromagnetic. So it stands to reason that if I start pulling out spins at random, that, uh, that occasionally and uh, quite frequently, actually uh, with increasing frequency as I pull out more atoms, the, the most important interaction will become anti-ferromagnetic. But of course, if I pull things out at random, I essentially wind up getting myself uh, a, a, a disordered uh, uh, material where I have mixed ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic interactions as I wanted, uh, uh, as I was requesting at the beginning of the talk. So uh, what happens? So if I dilute a little bit, the system is still ferromagnetic. This is a ferromagnetic Bragg peak, you know, just magnetization as a function of temperature for 0.67, nice susceptibility divergence. In this case, I measured it with neutrons rather than a coil. Uh, uh, there's all kinds of interesting uh, domain wall physics that one can do that. I won't uh, uh, discuss that, at, but at x equals 0.44, it's still ferromagnetic, but eventually, as I uh, reduce the concentration, I actually uh, find that the ferromagnetic state gives way to a, a spin glass state, and then eventually to another state, which I'm going to spend more time now uh, describing. So we have a clear deviation uh, below about uh, 0.3. Uh, okay, so 30% of the sites being occupied by magnetic atoms, 70% non-magnetic. Uh, when I get down there, I start getting interesting disorder effects on the magnetic ground state. And, and of course, the first thing that happens is you get uh, fairly conventional uh, spin glass states. You get uh, hysteretic uh, magnetic response. This just shows how different uh, things are on cooling and on warming for this composition. Uh, but uh, what I get here is, is classic uh, uh, spin, spin glass uh, behavior. I get, uh, of course, this is just showing the imagined, uh, this is basically just showing the real and imaginary parts of the susceptibility as a function of frequency for this sample. So as I cool down, you notice that, uh, and this is a logarithmic scale here, you get a very, very uh, rapid decrease in the characteristic frequency. And I also get a bronding of the spectral response, which is easier to see in the scaling plot, uh, where I just have superposed uh, all of the uh, uh, data uh, with a fixed peak amplitude, and you can see that for the, the, the high temperature, I get a narrow uh, response, but of course, as I cool down, I get more and more, a broader and broader distribution of barriers to relaxation, and I'm seeing these uh, exactly as I'm uh, supposed to be uh, seeing them. So nothing very unusual here. Not, and of course, the spin glass is really uh, not, a local, not a many body localized state at all. We know that everything actually talks to uh, everything else. Now, life gets much more interesting uh, when we go to a lower concentration, but still much higher than the concentrations at which I was showing you the optical data on the single line response at the beginning of the talk. I'm gonna go down here. And here, uh, what's, what uh, we noticed when we did our first experiments is that there didn't seem to be uh, much of a transition at all uh, this shows uh, the, uh, just the real part of the susceptibility as a function of temperature. And, and the, the, this susceptibility here just lay on a, on, a, uh, on, a, on a straight line on this log log plot, but with a slope of around 0.75, which may be familiar to all of you. This always shows up in this ordered system somehow. The Curie law, which is 1 over t, remember we saw it in the clean limit here at the quantum phase transition, for example, gets replaced by this, uh, this anomalous, uh, uh, anomalous uh, uh, power law 
uh, which is slightly less divergent. Okay, so there's some screening going on. Uh, together with uh, actually Sue Coppersmith, we were actually able to model this particular system, taking account only, strangely enough, of the electronic degrees of freedom as a random singlet phase or a, basically a bot lead type singlet phase. And actually, uh, the outcome here uh, basically were these black points. So the, they lay actually directly on top of the, uh, the red triangles. So that's the statics. Dynamics was uh, in some, some ways even more peculiar. Uh, so, instead of, uh, so before I showed you this very nice nesting of the magnetic susceptibility as you cooled, this is showing an anti-nesting as we cooled. So as we cool this system, the imaginary part of the susceptibility actually uh, wound up actually becoming narrower on the low frequency side of the spectrum. And the other thing that happened is that the peak frequency here, I'm scaling here by the peak, the peak uh, as I, and this is now an Arrhenius plot, no longer lies on the Arrhenius line. So this is frequency, the, this is the log of frequency versus one over t, but rather saturated. So this looked like a more interesting quantum mechanical state with almost some kind of a, 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 a pseudo gap appearing at low temperature. So the picture that one has of this state uh, is, is uh, shown here. So this is uh, physics by uh, PowerPoint. So that's essentially a, uh, now things got more interesting. So uh, we have this, this funny uh, many body singlet state. And, and uh, actually, at the time, we, uh, other people were getting different results for this experiment. So actually, shortly after, about five years after we did this experiment, a group in Canada actually got a slightly different result than we did. And in fact, said that this particular composition was a spin glass. And, and then we started to go and look back at the experiments. So we decided to actually vary the bath coupling, the coupling of the system to the thermal bath. Yeah, I've got a few minutes here. Yeah. And, and the question is, uh, you know, does, does, does that affect the outcome of these experiments? And we simply change the coupling of the bath essentially by, by, by the degree to which we, we essentially pressed essentially uh, sapphire rods against uh, the end of a sap. It's very, very primitive. And we found actually uh, very remarkable results. And, and uh, of course, you could say, well, this is just going to probe trivial uh, thermalization. Uh, but it isn't trivial thermalization that you control with this. So if we have a very strongly coupled sample, very strongly coupled to the, the refrigerator, uh, the idea is, of course, always that you want to wait for T goes to infinity. So T goes to infinity for uh, most of us is the lifetime of the graduate student. And so uh, what we did uh, was this was the lifetime, well, it was a little bit uh, out here, but basically he needed uh, to do a few experiments. Uh, but, the, but the bottom line is, if you have a simple thermalization, actually, uh, problem that you induce by coupling the system slightly in, in, a, in a weak way to the thermal bath, you should simply postpone the onset of equilibration. Well, that's what you see here in chi prime. But actually, in chi double prime, you have multiple crossings of the thermalization curve after you arrive at low temperatures. Okay, so that means this is, this is here, this red curve is not simply a time shifted version of the, of the blue curve. In fact, uh, what we did was uh, when we went to the very long time limit, both for the weak coupling to the thermal bath and strong coupling to the thermal bath, of course we arrive at susceptibility curves, susceptibility spectra, imaginary parts of the magnetic susceptibility as a function of frequency, uh, which are fingerprints of the state. And in fact, another thing that we can do is we can say, well, perhaps we don't really know the temperature of the system. Let's say, and, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna simply match uh, peak frequency. So if I have a system which was weakly coupled to the thermal bath, I simply, I simply say, well, my effective temperature is, is given by the peak frequency, and I should match that system with a system that's strongly coupled to the thermal bath with the same peak frequency. Okay, so I have a proxy, an internal thermometer of the system given by the peak frequency of the magnetic susceptibility. 
So if I pick, for instance, a peak frequency for, of six, her uh, 6 hertz, I can then do a scan of the susceptibility essentially around that peak frequency. And they have plotted uh, in a scaled form uh, for essentially two cases where the free frequency is the same. One is the uh, strongly connected sample to the bath, and one is a weakly connected. So peak frequency is the same. The typical temperature is the same. But if I look at the, uh, look at the spectrum, the spectrum for the strongly connected sample, the red one, uh, lies outside the weakly connected sample. So in other words, that one looks much more like the normal spin glass type response. On the other hand, that uh, hard drop that we saw before in the, in the experiments that I, sh uh, that, 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 that I showed uh, is seen for the sample which is, which is weakly coupled. Okay, so I get a different it looks like I get a state which is intrinsically more quantum mechanical, as I were, if I go with weak coupling than with strong coupling. Now, uh, one can actually uh, do all kinds of, uh, all kinds. so the bottom line is different states for different heat sinking, even in the long time limit, even when I use as a proxy the typical temperature. So, uh, and in fact, I can also uh, look at uh, these uh, Arrhenius plots uh, again, in, in the case strong coupling, I have a nice Arrhenius law being followed. In the case of weak coupling to the bath, I deviate. So I get a quantum uh, regime. Now, the nonlinear response of the states is also very, very dramatically different. And so, uh, how do we get different states? Well, of course, the hint, of course, in, in that is, 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 was in the initial phase of the talk when I showed you these complicated level schemes. Of course, the moment that I have complicated uh, level schemes for individual atoms, of course, if I put the atoms together, I get more complicated level schemes and I get avoided and unavoided level crossings. And of course, if I have a, a dense system, and in fact, four and a half percent concentration is dense, uh, if I have a dense system like, like, like this, then uh, if, I, if I travel down to the ground state, through this essentially uh, carnival ride of level crossings, uh, if, I, if I supply, if I have a, a place for the heat to go easily, quickly, while I do that, it stands to reason that I could actually wind up in a very different state at the end of the day than at the beginning. And of course, because it's, it's a many body system, uh, there's, there's of course a, a, a rooting problem here, which could take an infinite amount of time. And so I've, we've created this state, now we've played various games with it, we've looked at the effects of transverse shield. I'm, no, I'm finished, I think, right? I have, yes, yeah, zero, zero. zero. okay. Uh, so we've actually explored uh, using essentially transverse fields uh, to mix, uh, these, uh, mix these states and actually get towards the, the strong uh, bath coupling. This is shown here, I can walk you through this in a, in a minute. And uh, the other thing, uh, of course, that we've done is, is to use uh, a, a probe, which, as I say, people have not talked about in the context of many body localization, but which I think is very important, is we've used actually spectral hole burning to probe localization. And the idea here is that I have my spectrum, and in this case, actually, it's quite a hard spectrum, so it's quite a uh, quantum mechanical system for weak coupling to the bath. And uh, so I can then, of course, uh, uh, try to, uh, of course, this is a linear response, uh, okay, which is this uh, curve here. I can then, of course, uh, start to apply a, a, uh, a, a very strong field to the system. And if with a very strong field, uh, of course, I start to saturate uh, a strong oscillating field, of course, I can saturate two-level systems in this, in this uh, material, if there are independent two-level systems. And if I go in then with a linear response, I've actually effectively can burn a hole into that spectrum because I've saturated uh, these uh, levels. And the degree to which these levels are localized is, of course, uh, related to the degree to which and the narrowness of the hole that I find at the burning frequency. And, and, and we were able to show, and we're able to show that, that sure enough, in the system uh, which we suspect is more quantum mechanical, we can burn holes, whereas in the system uh, which is classical and strongly coupled to bath, we cannot. And this shows 
uh, essentially the, 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 the outcome of, of the, an experiment here. This is an attempt to burn a hole in the strong coupling case, which is the classical spin glass going towards this classical uh, sort of spin glass uh, state. You can't burn holes, whereas actually for the uh, for the, for the uh, weakly coupled uh, sample, we can actually uh, burn holes. So, of course, hole burning uh, is something that you can deduce immediately uh, from uh, this kind of uh, uh, picture here. Uh, let's imagine we have a, a set of spins uh, which don't talk to each other, uh, each of which is sitting, let's say, in a slightly different transverse field. If that's the case, then each transverse field uh, can be addressed at a particular frequency and only that frequency because nothing talks to anything else. And of course, uh, don't bother with this algebra, but uh, you can think about that if you want. But the essence of this is, is that you can actually burn holes into a system uh, like this, which is, which is localized for whatever reason, many body or other. Uh, but of course, you cannot if these spins are all uh, talking to each other. And, uh, of course, one can think about uh, pictures uh, of this uh, system, but I think since I've overstayed my welcome, uh, let me just uh, go right to the conclusions here. Uh, we uh, actually have a model magnet now, uh, which I believe we can use to test ideas about many-body localization. In this case, the, 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 what looks like the interesting composition regime is, a, is around a few percent. few percent does not sound like that much, but of course, if you take the cube root of that, you realize that means typically the atoms are only uh, you know 2.8 uh, lattice constants apart, and the dipole interaction is 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 quite long ranged. Uh, so so we have a strongly interacting many-body system, uh, where actually it seems that the coupling, uh, and actually macroscopic coupling to a thermal bath, not microscopic coupling, actually results in 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 different uh, many-body states. Uh, so in, this, in, in strong coupling, uh, you have uh, basically uh, a localization, uh, and uh, it, uh, sorry, spin glass. Uh, you have delocalization at a spin glass state. Uh, in the weak coupling, uh, you seem to have this uh, hidden sort of RVB random singlet state, and that random singlet state actually displays uh, signatures of many-body localization. Uh, in, the, in the very direct form of hole burning. So we actually have, for the first time, been able to, to use sort of, uh, a, a sort of a simple technique just with a susceptibility coil to show that, that the system does divide up into what seem to be uh, localized uh, substates, and it is not acting as its own bath. Uh, so hole burning, I think uh, what's interesting uh, in this particular system is that the cues, actually the holes are extraordinarily sharp. We get cues, effective cues of order 100,000 or so. Uh, there's also what I, and you have, will have noticed, is that the, the line shapes actually could be uh, peculiar. There's actually a Fano effect. At the end of the day, even though the holes are narrow, there's still a Fano effect. There's some small residual coupling to the other uh, to, to the other clusters, which results in a Fano uh, resonance. Uh, the other thing that if you analyze the, the holes, actually the, the, the response uh, as you, uh, the response actually at particular <coughs> values of transverse field uh, actually can become dissipationless. And actually where we see that happening is near uh, what appear to be level crossing resonances for the single line problem. Uh, Last, and this is the challenge to you, is, is uh, and, and this has of course been the uh, challenge to us when we've been dealing with the referees on this problem, is, is that the theory is not being constructed. In particular, uh, what I showed you, of course, was, was things happening at extraordinarily low frequencies. And, and, and one really, uh, really has to ask, you know, why, why uh, you know, what accounts for these very low frequencies and, and also why does it work as well as it does? It's extraordinary uh, how sharp these uh, how sharp these holes are. Uh, thank you very much. Questions? Question about your interpretation of at a random singlet. Yeah.
So you have, you have Ising spins interacting with dipolar interactions. So that's typically not something that leads to singlet formation. For singlets, ah. you need like exchange or yeah. Heisenberg spins or something like that. No, no, you can get basically there. Uh, this is where the higher lying crystal field levels come in. So what happens, of course, is the, the uh, dipolar interaction has, of course, is, uh, talks to three components of the spin. And so, so even though you have a, a, a ground state, which is an Ising doublet, they're excited states. And so you can actually mix in. Effectively, you have internal transverse fields that are derived, with, which come from the, uh, uh, from the dipolar, inter uh, dipolar interaction itself. Uh, because, because you, 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 and this is a quantum mechanical effect, because you mix in these, these high lying states, which are not terribly far away. Now, if they were hundreds of degrees away, they wouldn't matter, but, but the point is there's a mixing uh, that, that accounts for that. And that's, in fact, what the, the simulation, basically the decimation uh, that, uh, that we did with uh, Sue Coppersmith. Um, in the pure uh, magnetic mm -hmm. system, where you were measuring susceptibility, and you said it was very mean field-like, Mm -hmm. Did you see any logarithmic corrections that uh, should be there they should, we, in they, four dimensions? We, we did not. But on the other hand, we did not work that hard on, on seeing that. But, but they should be there. But they're, they're certainly not. What's interesting is actually the quantum phase transition. We have more decades <laughs> of the reduced parameter in a transverse field than we have of temperature because it's much easier to control field that to control temperature because, of course, we can put the <coughs> superconducting magnet into persistent mode. And there's no such thing as a persistent mode for a temperature controller. So, so we have more decades. So on the quantum mechanical side, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, we've, we've gone very far. But of course, there, the upper critical dimensionality anyway is three, uh, just for short range interactions. And of course, it goes down from there. So, so but there, it's, there's no logarithmic corrections. And the other question was, um, I didn't quite understand how you do the whole burning experiment because I think you are running out of time. But how do you know that you're not locally heating oh, the sample because you, at low millikelvin temperatures? You are, you are of course, heating it, and, and, and that's shown directly in the, uh, you, know, you can see that. And so, you know, you, you will inevitably, inevitably, it will result in, in a certain amount of heating. So this is basically, uh, this, is a, this is at 110 millikelvin, and this is before you put the pump on. And so what happens is, 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 is you, then, uh, you then, what you then do is you match uh, the typical temperature of the system uh, with, with the heated, this is heated without the pump. Okay, so you can see that the typical temperature goes up to something like 150 millikelvin when you do it. So there is some, uh, some uh, obviously delocalization, but actually remarkably little, and uh, enough to, of course, keep uh, keep a very sharp hole. So yeah, that's. I apologize for being stupid, but uh, you know you show the phase diagram with the spin glass phase, and then there is this law concentration mysterious phase. Now, you said here, if we turn on thermalization, then we recover some spin glass. Right. But how does this phase diagram actually, you know, look like for various degrees of thermalization? Or is it uh, even a meaningful question to ask? Well, I, th I, think, I think it is a meaningful question to ask. And that's, of course, the question we asked uh, you know, for these experiments is, 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 you know, do you get a different, uh, a different ground state uh, you know, depending on, on how the system, on, on, on the history of the system as it was cooled. And that, that phase diagram, look, I, I showed it to you with a question mark. <laughs> uh, there was a reason. Uh, let me just go back here, sorry. So the phase diagram was shown for, uh, so here's, here's the phase diagram. 
<laughs> so so the, the, the bottom line is, is it, it seems that here, uh, you know, it depends how you do the experiment. And, but, it, but it's not a trivial, I mean, normally, uh, there aren't such question marks because if you wait long enough, you always get the same answer. I, I did, I did, and then there were questions that were raised. <laughs> no, this is this. I, I, well, this this is the long time limit for weak coupling to the bath. And the the point that I'm making is is that 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 uh, and, and this is what's you know that what we're seeing is that in the long time limit, depending on where the system had been on uh, during during its cooling. In, in particular, if there had been a lot of uh, uh, phonons around, uh, then the system winds up in a different state, and it's, it's more likely to wind up in this localized, uh, many-body localized state than if it was strongly coupled to the bath while it was cooling. And so the phase diagram is different. Now, the equilibrium, what you would call the classical equilibrium phase diagram, uh, in, in our view, probably has a spin glass phase here, although the transition has not been seen. The actual transition, but but the uh, air marks, the yeah. slowing down has been seen. Thermalize the spin glass phase. Extends. The spin glass phase extends further. Yeah, yeah. If you thermalize it, but the point is, it, thermalizing it, it is is in this case is is a statement about uh, uh, literally an exponential of a graduate student lifetime, <laughs> which is a very long time. Yeah. One final yeah. Question. yeah. Yes, well, it's, it's, it's more of a comment. I understand correctly that your materials are kind of three-dimensional, right? They are not kind of, they are. They're, they are, yeah. So yeah, that's actually real. interesting because uh, yeah. I would say that theoretically it's highly controversial whether MBL ever actually exists in that dimension. So, uh, yeah, with that, <laughs> that's just what I wanted to say. Yeah. I mean, I, I should just leave you with a thought. I mean, if you, uh, you know, if you take any cold atoms, it's it is out of equilibrium and the, actually the minute and if, if you're uh, uh, you know not a terribly nice person you go into a, a, a cold atom lab and you you open the, the vacuum to the air then of course that everything will disappear it'll all thermalize and 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 in fact all of these states will will vanish so i think in in a, in a real sense what we have here is essentially a, a system where uh, it's an insulator. There aren't very many channels to relaxation, and so e even on sort of macroscopic time scales that we have, uh, it simply exists there as as a cold atom system would try to equilibrium equilibrate itself by itself, and so that's why we then actually can access this this interesting uh, random singlet phase, which displays uh, these uh, interesting localization problems. And the the other interesting thing is, of course. In, in, what we've done, I think, for the first time is we have a local proxy temperature. So the typical temperature that we would talk about if we were doing, you know, normal statistical mechanics, the typical temperature is the same, but the spectrum is different. And the response of the spectrum is different, even when we match spectra. So we have an internal thermometer here, uh, which we can use uh, to, to define what is typical. And what is typical is, 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 is what we usually like to think is the only thing that matters uh, when we couple uh, to a bath. All right, so let us thank all speakers again. Sorry, the coupling to the to the nuclear spins didn't seem to play much of a role, right?